chapter of downtown breakout group. Pat, glad you're here. <laughs> Ken, glad you're here. All right. Um, we're really glad to have you. Thank you very much to Ricarda for introducing the work we have done thus far in the uh, public information session. We have a bunch of folks. Um, instead of introducing ourselves, because we have so many, let's, if you speak, please just introduce yourself and you know, maybe something distinctive about you. Uh, we do have 20 minutes. Um, this is our chance to listen to you. So my job as facilitator is to just make sure that we have everybody shares the air and nobody goes on too long and we listen carefully. Um, we have a scribe. So Peter is going to take down what you are saying. And if we have a chance at the end, maybe we'll just read through to make sure we've captured things faithfully. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a circle before or had a talking object, but we have two talking <laughs> objects here, and you have to choose. Uh, this one is called Sea Sparkle, and this one is um, Salmonella. So I want everybody to say after me, we want Salmonella. <laughs> Perfect, we'll use this one. Okay, um, so our, uh, the prompts for you all tonight are... Um, what opportunities in this area haven't you heard yet, mentioned yet, right? So we have, we have a sort of funnel of ideas that are coming to the commission or things that we're aware of, and, and, but we're very cognizant that we don't know everything. We're not aware of all the opportunities out there. Uh, you are some of our best sources of information, so please think in that mindset. Um, are there other ideas you'd like to share? And then uh, what would you like to be part of in this area in terms of getting involved in the action, volunteering, stepping up, things like that. So, um, and then the last one to be thinking about is what do you think other people in the community need in this area? So I've just loaded you with all four potential questions, but I'm doing that now because we only have 20 minutes and um, we may not get to go through them in order. So, speak now for all your peace. You have someone up. Pat Inkley. Um, I haven't heard anything about hardening off buildings downtown, and it feels like that's really important to do an assessment of, you know, the M&T Bank did it, <laughs> not totally successfully, but... Does that mean like closing off from water? What is hardening? Um, they, they put in structures to close off for the doors, and you can do it with windows, too. I have Salmonella for a second. Pat, thank you for that. One thing that we are not going to do very much of is respond because we really want to hear from you. Please trust that we are taking this in and um, in some cases if you see my jaw drop you'll know we hadn't thought about that at all. And if you don't see my jaw drop, you know, we may be aware of it. Did you drop drop? It did not. <laughs> Carolyn Budinsky and I'm supposed to say something about myself. No. no carry on. Um, I uh, think there's a lot of parking lots that could be made a little more resilient. Yes. yes. Ken Jones, I have salmonella. <laughs> I, I want to build on that. It's the state office complex. It has changed tremendously since COVID, and the pressures that used to be those parking lots have been reduced, but I'm not so sure what the state is doing with regards to the vast real estate holdings that they have. And can those be reconsidered, repurposed, rebuilt in such a way to allow the downtown to grow? Uh, John Copan, this is a very small idea in uh, one of the subcategories, but I'm on the Wrightsville Beach Board, and people come from there all the time. That's a great space to do some education about the waterway and how we use the waterway. So it's like thinking about interpretive materials at Wrightsville and other places where we access the water, not just in Montpelier. I just wonder about, um, you know, when we were talking about Montpelier used to be uh, so thriving, like at lunchtime with all the workers in the state office buildings and stuff. And I'm just wondering about bringing people back to those office buildings so that they're in that town Montpelier and the merchants benefit from that. And, um, you know, then people still get their the work done, um, but I haven't heard much about reopening the offices and like, you know, what's going to happen to all those workers, so I'm really interested in what would happen with that. And your name is Tim? Oh, Tim. Yeah, Flynn. <laughs> a 
I saw you thinking. <laughs> sure. I'm Jack McCullough. I'm the mayor. Um, and I, the questions that people are raising about the, the state workers downtown, we don't know either. And the state doesn't know. And we would love to see those workers back downtown and spending money. But if they're not going to be downtown spending our money, uh, we really want to see all their real estate put to something more productive than waiting for workers to park their cars who aren't going to show up. Um, I I work in a building that has no elevator, hasn't had an elevator, and maybe never will. I don't know what's going on. People live in the building. It's not the only one. I'm sure everyone here knows about that. Um, I haven't heard much about like how to build buildings without having massive infrastructure get destroyed like that. Um, I understand, you know, putting in vinyl floors and moving your stuff out of the basement, but an elevator is really important for a lot of people, and I, I haven't heard much about what's going on and why they're so hard to fix. What you mean? Oh, uh, sorry, Eileen Shun. And then, uh, is it a building that had an elevator that is now destroyed by flood? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's both residential and office. Got it. Okay. Kara Robichek. I'm reminded of the fact that my son and eight or nine of his friends boated to Montpelier High School at the end of last school year. And it occurs to me that the river and this building are very connected, and I'm hoping that some of the education can go through the schools and can involve the students. So bear with me, I'm Elvira, bear with me. In the Czech Republic, a mandatory school subject is rafting, <laughs> river rafting on rubber boats, um, because it was targeted as an area of cultivation for outdoor recreation. So I think very much in keeping with your comment, it's something to look at in terms of really developing the river as an attraction um, through like cultivated sports, and activities and high school subjects involving inflatable rafts. I can't get rid of this. <laughs> Can I add? Yeah. I started with state. I also want to mention the federal office building, which is the former home of the post office will be, re will be re renovated in some fashion. And so that's a prime opportunity to rebuild that in such a way that is flood resilient and meets the needs of the city in regards to housing, whatever we need in terms of other services in the city. So how, and, and I want to get to that state thing, Montpelier has a lot of loud voices. If we can use our loud voices to convince our state partners that they need to listen to us, because we can be a pain, do that and then use that practice to then work on the feds. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of parking lots in Montpelier. Perhaps some people think perhaps there are too many. They could be made into these nice bowls that receive a lot of water and they could be skate parks and, and playgrounds and all kinds of stuff when it's not flooding. Green gardens. We're gonna, um, I'm just going to remind, one of our last questions is, what do you think other people in the community need in the area of adaptive downtown? Sometimes it helps me to, I sort of have my own issues, but it helps me to think about, try to guess at what other people might need. Like, I understand that. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Holloway, I'm uh, Salmonella. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that was brought up in the previous um, forum was just uh, the need to um, kind of get out of this uh, combined sewers, um, uh, storm water systems that are really impacting the, the neighborhoods um, around our downtown during flooding events. So just kind of want to bring that point up again. It really does relate to Salmonella. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get this, get this anyway. Yeah. Do you have E. coli over there? Do you have E. coli over there? I don't have that. You know, it's, it's tempting to bring a whole collection, isn't it? <laughs> so who, uh, let me ask a different question. 
How many of you have traveled, even, say, to Barrie, uh, or much <laughs> further afield, into places that are connected to their rivers and that have probably experienced or may experience what we just faced in July? And did you observe anything about those places that we could use? I see Pat. Oh, darn. Yeah, you, you flinched. You brought the painting. <laughs> I'm Pat Moulton. Um, been to uh, Venice, and Venice has a lot of water around it. And um, Venice has done a lot of what's called wet proofing to prepare for the water and just understand it's coming, it's not going away. Uh, I couldn't tell you what that was, but, but they've adapted to the fact that the water is rising and it's not going to change. Half salmonella. <laughs> I mean, Sean, I, um, uh, I was in. Um, oh, oh, oh great. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Let's hear the person on mine just okay. since we're alert to it. Hang on just a second. Yeah. Hi, Elizabeth Parker here. I'm curious about uh, what is being done to collect information on hydrological changes that have happened uh, in downtown, for instance. The um, post office supposedly has a stream that has surfaced and it's across the street from Christ Church. And, uh, you know, we're curious about what is happening uh, with that and, and have uh, not been able to get any information uh, from uh, the uh, people who supervise that building. Uh, so we've also experienced um, a lot of. Uh, structural uh, damage of uh, sinkholes that happened that caused uh, natural pipes to bore through the foundation. Uh, and I'm just curious uh, what information is being gathered on, uh, you know, of that nature around town so that we can understand and share with one another uh, how the formation of the water underneath our buildings is changing because it's going to have a big effect on us as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Nathan speaking. That's a great question. Um, and I think, so one of the things that I, I'm, I'm uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically responding, one of the things we're aware of is that the state is about to embark on a scoping study for this for this area about uh, the Munduski River and things like that, and I, I, we can ask for sure whether that will include the kind of question you're asking. Uh, so thank you for raising that. Did I see? No. I mean, yeah. I All took right. it from you. I don't know why I took that from you. No, that's okay. <laughs> you wanted to talk. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to get back to your, your um, prompt earlier. I was down the Jersey Shore last summer, two weeks after the flood here, and um, in a place that is a very thin island and gets flooded quite often and they have made major requirements of any new construction that everything has to be well off the ground and so what you see is houses that are built on pylons and parking underneath nobody has a ground floor entrance that's been built in the last 15 years i don't think so i i don't know what this town would look like but it works and it's interesting so it's something to think about Um, before I pass it back to Jack, we are close on time. I'm sure we're going to hear, hear a bell soon. You don't have to leave. If you don't wish to go to another group, you can hang in and see what the next group says. Uh, we'll see what we have for turnout. But if you wish to, at the, at the bell, Watersheds is back in the auditorium, and uh, uh, response is right next door over here. Jack. Thank you. Jack McCullough again. I just want to point out that there are things that we can do right. You know, there's a lot, there was a lot of damage downtown, but the new buildings that were built uh, after our uh, our new code was uh, was put in place got through it. They didn't flood. The city center building, which was built back in the uh, 1980s, and the uh, <coughs> The transport transit station and uh, and apartments and uh, there are a couple of other places like that that didn't flood so we can be adaptive and plan for survivability and that's part of what we really need to keep doing. Thank you. So 
So there's, this, I can't remember, there's a small city in Maryland that gets significant floods <coughs> every five years. Um, and it's a very historic town. And so they, no, it's not Annapolis. It's in a, in a in, river. Indicott. It's in a, what's, what is it? In, Ellicott or Indicott? And, and, yeah, yeah, Ellicott. Ellicott, 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 Ellicott City. City. Yeah, and so you know, they, they've been able to maintain their historic buildings, and they get flooded regularly. So I don't know what, what they're doing, and it's, it's tragedy, it's horrible, but they're still there. All right, so my last prompt, if we have any time, and, and uh, you can also respond to this in writing on Post-its, on the posters out there, uh, email, any way you like. One of the things we are very conscious of is that we, the only power we have is given by you, right? You sort of called this into being. We are trying to work on your behalf. Uh, what, what is it going to look like to you uh, a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, if we have had an impact? We as a commission and we as a commission working on your behalf. I'm very curious to hear if folks can sort of visualize forward. Well, I wrote a whole story, <laughs> and it's out there if you want to read it about what happened and what comes next, what came in the future when we did these things. Where is it? When you say it's uh, out there? It's on the table. There are a few left. I, oh, great. I gave them to all of you all on the council. Thank you so much. Please <coughs> Okay. That's great. Uh, Paul Burns, uh, I think it won't be that there are no more climate catastrophes. Uh, we don't have that power here, but yeah. um, but did, did, that the actions that are being discussed here and in the different uh, groups uh, are having an impact. So therefore, the flooding is less than it would have been um, in our downtown, and that you know buildings and other structures are not as vulnerable. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody up? Even if you're standing, just get up. It's good for you. <laughs> yes, good to see you. Uh, just write it down outside. Okay. Folks who care about Montpelier, do not have to sit, but you are welcome to find a seat. My name is Nathan Souter. I'm a member of the commission. I'm grateful that you are here tonight. We are grateful that you are here tonight. Um, I'm going to be the facilitator. We have a scribe, so Peter Walk is writing down everything that you say. Uh, he's probably embellishing a whole bunch, but you know. <laughs> um, uh, Ricardo uh, spoke to you from the stage. We have Ben Doyle. We have Katie Trouts. We have Greg Gossens. Am I missing any commission members? Oh, uh, Paul Carnahan. Thank you. Uh, okay, so. We're, we want to hear from you. We want your ideas. We want your understanding of new opportunities. Um, we want anything you can share to us. I'll, I'll read you a couple of prompts in, in a minute. Um, we're not going to be doing much responding, right? So we, this is really intake. Peter's going to record it. Um, we are aware. We have we have sort of a, an idea funnel or a project funnel, right? So we have things that we're aware of that we're contemplating and trying to figure out what we should do about. Uh, but we're starkly aware that we don't know everything. And in fact, people who live here in this city, who have numerous connections and networks, are great resources. And that's you. So please give us what you got. Um, to, to the prompts, I'm going to read all the prompts that I want you to respond to. So try and hold those in your head. Respond to anyone that you feel, feel good about. Uh, what are opportunities in this area that you haven't heard about yet or haven't heard mentioned from us yet? That's the adaptive downtown area. Are there other ideas you'd like to share? Um, what would you like to be part of in this area? So if, we're, if you're going to take action, volunteer, step up, uh, how might you do that? And then what do you think other people in the community might need in this area? Um, we are going to, if, if you've been in a talking circle or use a talking object, we have two to choose from. Uh, this one is called Sea Sparkle, and this one is called Salmonella. <laughs> so I want everybody to say after me, we want salmonella. <laughs> Perfect. We'll use, we'll use this one. All right. Um, so if I pass this to you, please introduce yourself uh, and then let us share your information. I will do a little bit of managing if, uh, if folks are going on longer. We want to hold space for everybody in the room. Catch it. Anybody can catch someone else, Donna. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Okay, Donna Bain. Uh, my question is, 
It's wonderful to plan ahead, and I love all the information you're gathering and posting because we all need to learn. But I'm very anxious about not having any focus on some immediate resources. Like, I mean, I read a lot about some places in, that actually put out these big, huge, inflatable, they put water in these tubes to have immediate uh, way to keep water out of their stores. I'd like to see some fundraising and projects that deal with, if it happens tomorrow, we've got something to pull out of the garage and put in front of stores, doorways. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm curious. Who are you? I'm Dan Jones. Hi. Uh, I am curious on this uh, adapting existing buildings to flood resilience. Has there been a lot of research on that? Because it's uh, it sounds like something that if we have it two or three times, it kind of <laughs> washes away the uh, the underpinnings. It kind of gets into the rot area, and so uh, you know, I, I guess it comes down to the idea is uh, you know, even though we have a beloved historic downtown, is it really possible to insulate it? <laughs> I'm glad it was short. Um, yeah, actually, in answer, oh, sorry, Barbara Conry. In, in response to your question, Dan, yes, there are quite a few resources from FEMA about some things called wet proof, wet flood proofing, dry flood proofing. We can protect our buildings. Um, you know, many of you are aware of the former Chittenden Bank building, now the M&T Bank, that has a giant floodgate. At, at their entrance. Those are the kinds of things that I think we need to be looking at and producing. We need to keep everything out of basements. We need to keep mechanical systems out of basements. And so I think what I'd be interested in seeing is that we develop a checklist or some kind of working plan for the existing downtown. And it may take looking at each building individually, but developing a plan for how we can address uh, a flood resilience and um, for each of the buildings and dealing with that. Uh, I kind of agree, but I, I would, oh, I'm Sal Alfano. Um, I wouldn't want to put all our eggs in one basket, and I, I, um, I've been looking at redevelopment of the downtown in what I call the pit. I guess people know it as the pit, but you know the giant parking lot, the big donut hole in the middle of Montpelier, um, which is a complex real estate situation. But I think the time might be right to approach the uh, competing ownership of that area so that we have a backup uh, and as the city expands, I mean, you can't expand into that historical district downtown. Really, the, the, it seems to me the ideal place to expand downtown is into that centralized Could you define area. the area you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Because the, the, the refers to several talking, different places I'm in downtown. I'm talking about to the uh, east of the State House, the, the parking lot. Court behind Street. the trash and okay. behind the, okay. the okay. post office. That, that is uh, Court Street. Right, right. Okay. Heard Court, Court Street. Street. Yeah. Oh. This is what I love about Vermont Montpelier. <laughs> he just said behind the thrush. So the pit that Sal is referring to is bounded by Court Street, the street that runs up past the pavilion, uh, State Street, East State Street. No, State Street. State Street. And, uh, Elm. 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 Yeah. Right? So that sort of invisible area back there. Thank you. Oh, all right. I'm Rob Goodwin. Um, I think on that front, you know, I, talking about new construction downtown, um, and I think one, one interesting point here is that, you know, the, the biggest development downtown that didn't get built, you know, years ago was the, the new hotel and parking garage. Um, if you look at the water elevations of, like, where things came and, like, how that would have fared and how that was designed, um, it would have been fine. And, you know, and so it's like the, just doubling down on the fact that new development is really our opportunity to create the space and to create the sort of like economic, no, economic activity and the housing resources in this town that are safe. <laughs> um, and also, you know, it's like a project like that. Um, you know, it's like we don't have a hotel right now. It's like there's no place for people to come to town to like go like, you know, patron these restaurants at which, uh, you know, lost a lot and, you know, need the business to really get back on their feet. Um, and so. It's that project didn't happen 
you know, I think for some complicated reasons everyone know here, but I think we should remember that, that, you know, new development in this town, um, although may not be the exact thing that we want, like it is an opportunity to not be in the floodplain. Even if it is built in the floodplain, we can build it right, you know, from the beginning. Paul told him that I wouldn't catch it. <laughs> he outed me. Um, so I'm Nancy Boone, and uh, I just wanted to throw out something in relation to what's out there that can help us know what the possibilities are. The National Park Service has done an amazing amount of work with historic areas around the country in looking at how people are preparing for a flood, how they're responding, what kinds of physical changes are being made, and they, uh, even though they're the National Park Service, they're happy to assist communities, and um, I've worked with several people at the Park Service who I'm sure would love to come and give a public program, okay. and so that could, be, that could be fun, and just sharing information and building uh, on our optimism. Nice. <laughs> yeah, hold on one second. Before I give it a sound. Oh, yeah. Is there anybody on the Zoom? Someone's standing against the wall there. I can pause for Zoom questions if there are some. Okay. okay. Um, my name is Alana Wilson. I'm a Mormon, and I grew up here in Montpelier. I went to this high school, <laughs> um, and I recently returned to raise my young family here. And one of the things that I'm really thinking about as we have these conversations is we love our historic downtown. There's like a nostalgia inherent in this place, and it's really clear that we're going to have to make some really dramatic changes if we want to keep living here. Like the fact is we cannot keep doing it the way we've been doing it. So I am curious about what are the conversations we need to be having within the community to get people ready for that reality. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm still Sal Fano. Um, everybody here seems to be interested in, in this topic, obviously. And after, after the flood, I did a little research on you know search terms like watershed management, that sort of thing. And I discovered a report called the Vermont Resilient, the Vermont Economic Resilient Initiative, which was published in 2015 by a group like this one, after Irene, which happened in 2011, so four years later. Uh, and in it, I mean, it might be worth a read. It's, I think it's available in PDF form or online, um, because there are, uh, there's a focus on five projects where they, they they adapted uh, existing uh, infrastructure, or they um, changed the, their relationship with the river. Um, so several different solutions to problems similar to what we have, and it gives you a good idea of, of how, what can be done and what it, what it looks like and how it works. Um, so again, Vermont Resilient, Vermont Economic Resiliency, Initiative. So we'll put that, we'll put that, I've seen that report. It's yeah. excellent. We'll put it on the we'll put it Yeah, it is a good report. Okay, great. And just to piggyback further, uh, some of the images you saw in the slides of you know the architectural drawings or renderings of downtown or various river corridors, those came from other movements like that. That you know, let's think about the capital area. Let's think about this river and let's, and, and there, so there are a lot of concepts, there are a lot of projects that have been at least um, studied enough to create drawings and, and action items. And then they're, you know, they're waiting, they're dormant. So if you come across more of those, and we have Paul Carnahan is, knows a ton about the history of this area. Greg Gosses has been involved in some of those process projects. So we've got some of that, but there could be things we're missing. So I think, thank you for that. It's great. Yeah, in reference to that, Nathan, the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition did a um, pretty extensive competition um, uh, to redevelop, yes, thanks, Dan, to redevelop the, uh, the downtown in a more sustainable and also more energy efficient way. And so many of those addressed the whole issue because we didn't let them off the hook about the, our, our uh, water issues. And so many of those addressed um, a 
expanding the water, the, the floodplain, and allowing for that to happen. The big challenge was, however, and I'll, I'll bring this up, is yes, new buildings are great and they are above the floodplain, but if you start talking about the big parking lot that's down behind the state buildings, the f uh, flood level is at least 10 or 12 feet above that that level. So if we start building buildings that are elevated 10 or 12 feet above grade, then what does our downtown look like? Um, Cassie, you may have missed the introduction, but anyone can catch someone else. I picked up on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Kasha. Um, I am curious to hear what the state is doing and how the state intends to lead the way on their land that they own. The state owns a significant portion of downtown. And from what I see, I do not see the state following their own best management practices when it comes to how they treat the river, how they build buildings, flood resilience. And I would love to see the state demonstrate to us through their actions exactly what a flood resilient space can look like on their own land and would love to see our community encourage the state to do so. Encourage is a nice word. <laughs> <laughs> I would say crash. <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, we're not responding, but just to, I'm oh, sorry. But just to quickly say, like, that is so key, right? Like, what, 40% of downtown is pavement yeah. controlled by the state. state. And just so you know, like, um, Pat Moulton, I don't know if you know her, but she's here. Yeah. She's the Central Vermont Recovery Officer for the state. Pat's had every great job in Vermont when it comes to community and economic yeah. development and gets stuff done. Yes. And, you know, we've definitely been a part of conversations already between city, BGS, Vermont Mutual. You know, there's obviously an opportunity with the federal building that there's just a lot of chess pieces. And I think the state absolutely can demonstrate leadership in what a truly resilient downtown can look like. And unlike Barrie, where you have, you know, 40 individual homeowners have to take a buyout in order to have some grand vision, they could really, the state could just negotiate with themselves and make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> I just want to, on, on, uh, on Kasha's word, encourage, and, uh, and the sort of, you know, hold folks to their own standards. One of the things that we could use your thoughts and support on, you know, each of these different partners, we'll call them partners, you know, requires a, a maybe a different approach, different connections, different strategy. You know, sometimes you catch catch more with honey than with vinegar, and sometimes, you know, as in the post office, the strategy we were adapting is, you know, full frontal assault. <laughs> so far repelled, but um, so anyway, you know, we're trying to think constructively about how how we as a community can get the most out of these ideas, and your ideas on that are useful, useful as well. Uh, uh, Pat. Oh, wait a second. Uh, wait a second. Uh, you had a turn, so you, you just took someone all back. We won't use the disease spreading mechanism <laughs> analogy here. I'm Judy Walk, and I'm a member of Christ Episcopal Church, which, as you know, got a, a lot of water again. And what I'm learning is that, you know, the people in the church who are trying to figure out how the hell to build back better, safer, are learning a ton of stuff. And I don't know that anybody is sharing what they're learning from wherever they're gleaning this kind of either professional engineers or funding agencies or pick one. You know, I, I wish there was a way to be sure that those people were telling each other what they learned about the different kinds of wet and dry and all this stuff that, you know, to find a way that people who are trying to take action now um, have access to what other people have found out. I have no idea how you would do that. But it feels like there's an opportunity. It has a good point. Can we connect through you? Oh, Katie. <laughs> Can we connect through you to, to people? Oh, you gotcha. Okay. Well, mine's sort of related because it, we talked about this in the first session, but I think education is so important because mm -hmm. not everybody is on the same wavelength as everybody in here. And we have to understand that the water is going to come again and things are going to get worse and we have to be preemptive and it doesn't have to be bad it can be good so I think oops I'm, sorry no it's great um i love what you just said and i, I have, if you're okay to pivot a little bit 
What do you? What do folks think we need if we were to, to launch an ed education effort and we had three themes that we're going to talk about to, to the public? What do you think we would need to cover? What are the urgent ones that are misunderstood? Um, I'm Jared Duval, and just to build on the last two comments, I wonder um, about some sessions that would kind of just present options for adapting existing buildings for flood resilience. It, it seems to me like there's, I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's enough variables at play that it is probably almost like some kind of decision tree. If X, Y, or Z is present, then you know, here are your options. If, if not, then here are your options. And I just don't have a really good sense of how much that is known by the different building owners down Town. I feel like what you were saying, Judy, like I'm aware of similar conversations happening at the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, and I think that these are probably happening, you know, building by building, and the extent to which common themes or common learning could be, could be shared, um, I think could be really helpful so that everybody doesn't feel like they're doing it on their own. And, you know, maybe that's bringing in experts or sharing local expertise in kind of open forums. Um, but it feels like there's enough different options for what does this, what does adapt existing buildings for flood resilience mean that it's worth digging deeper and sharing more knowledge. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to add a uh, sadder note here. I've been talking to a bunch of the downtown merchants. And a couple of realities that I think we have to face is that many of the merchants are not owners of the buildings, they're renters, okay? And one of the things that has been striking me in the conversations I've had is they said, I can't do this again, okay? So if there is a prospect of another flood, it's not that the build, what the building owner does, it is uh, this dislocation of the, uh, the merchants which uh, creates a whole other category of both learning and support. So I think some part of this has to be around creating a sense within our merchant community that there is some kind of support being built toward the future of our downtown and that, they, that it is there for them as uh, if another disaster strikes. Because without them, I, I, like I said, a lot of them say, I can't do this, I'm, I, I'm not gonna bother. So uh, I think we have to kick that to account. So whether the building gets fixed or not, and some of them are, hard, are far from being fixed yet, uh, you know, we've, we've got a problem. Uh, go ahead. I think there's a name. Paul Costello. I think there's a like a fundamental contradiction in this kind of work between being holistic and looking for a big long-term solution that solves everything, or being pragmatic and identifying things that will move the ball. And I think that one one question I have is the potential of the the commission to provide leadership point to point rather than top down we're going to teach you folks what's good for the future <laughs> demonstration projects like had has there been a conversation with efficiency vermont about getting in line and trying to replace building by building heating systems and demonstrating that montpelier is a place that's modeling solutions for upstairs electric heating that both climate friendly and also um, not destroyed in whatever next flood happens. Like things like that, that tell a story that's good for the community to hear and also others, but also looking at things like the doors and is there a pattern for doors? Um, we're not gonna move everybody out. We don't have top-down control over the decisions of people who put sweat equity for generations in these buildings and who are, you know, have a livelihood depends on it. We have the opportunity to to set out markers that show some of the ways forward and also argue with the different powers that be. One of the conversations in the other room was, what's the authority of the commission? And there is no authority to the commission. But in truth, because the whole community has had opportunities to throw their ideas at the commission, the commission is empowered to represent the community and take bold, direct, sequential action that builds momentum. Momentum's more valuable than a final solution because the final solutions are going to take a generation. That's my guy. Thank, Thank you. you.
Uh, Ken and then Peter. And Peter. So I'm Ken Jones, and when I was at the Agency of Commerce post Irene. So when a lot of this resilience discussion happened there, um, I, I got to participate. And one of the themes I think that's very important is resilience is a lot easier if there's an economic strength before the event. So I would, and I know this is an opinion that not everyone shares, but may, maybe there's enough momentum. We need to support economic growth in our downtown or else our economic growth is going to happen along the interstate exits. Because where is the next hotel going to be built? There's one in Randolph right off the exit, talking about expanding up in Berlin because we didn't want one here. Mm -hmm. And if we keep doing that, we're not going to have the economic strength in our downtown. So when the next event does happen, it will be much easier for those businesses to leave. So I, I really would like us to rally our support to say, we may be building buildings that don't appeal to everyone's aesthetic sense, but if it draws in more people and draws in more activity, that's what we're going to need to get through the next flood. You pass to Peter. I think to, not to, uh, Peter Walk, by the way. Uh, I think the thing that I think about a lot post-flood is, it's a bit of a counterpoint to what you said, Dan, not to disagree with you that it's that our merchants are facing a somber reality. But in the immediate aftermath, I was surprised anybody wanted to come back. <laughs> yeah. yes. um, and I give a huge shout out to Katie Trouts over there for rallying our businesses to be able to, you know, to understand what they needed to do to have good information because it was in short supply. But the fact that everybody wanted to come back and their community rallied around them is one of our strengths and we need to figure out how to build from that. We just had talked a little about infrastructure and you know improvements after the flood, and I think it's worth mentioning that um, in the city planning department, I think did a pretty good job of doubling down and making sure that you know existing regulations said that substantial improvements required that when that equipment was replaced, it goes to be above you know it's prote it's protected, um, and I don't know that. Like that hasn't necessarily maybe been as much of a you know public announcement that that was you know that that happened and that you know in the education front maybe something that can happen is like okay well huh, this commission speaking for like those that are concerned about resiliency in Montpelier are saying like here are here are the guidance here if there's a landowner that maybe didn't do this or this is happening um, you know this is what the rules say this is what this is what it has to be thank you um, that's our bell we'll hear from Barbara and. Um, there are pieces of paper out on tables. There are post-it notes. Lots of opportunities to give us input. Please don't be shy. I know not everybody wants to speak up in front of the group. Yeah. Um, in reference to that, I'm involved with the Unitarian Church of Montpelier, and we went to uh, replace our heating system, and the city told us that it had to be two feet above the floodplain, which was the, the flood level was our lower floor. And um, so we kind of went berserk and had to raise all kinds of money and we were like you know really grumbling about it and then the flood came and our mechanical system was fine so it, you know you can definitely see the value of it yeah. <laughs> i want to applaud the throwing and catching in here it's been really good this season's been on your team here <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you.